Yeah, so thanks for everybody for, for making it to this virtual science tavern. I guess we all wish we could be, you know, in Manuel's tavern sort of kicking back and enjoying this, but um, hopefully you'll have some fun this Saturday. So yeah, as Lewis mentioned, um, today's talk is going to deal with ancient DNA, Neanderthals, and human health. And so just to go back over a little bit of stuff, I'm uh, at Georgia Tech in the School of Biological Sciences. You can see this is the my current lab, and you see we've got a diverse group of people. We study all sorts of questions, but it's sort of a mix of population genetics, and then we also look at the genetic basis of health disparities. So, yeah, so just to give you an outline of what I'm going to be going over tonight, um, we've got three main questions, and of course, any questions relative to these topics, you know, feel free to, to type them in chat. Um, the first is basically getting at this issue of what can DNA tell us about human history? You know, so it's sort of like what can biology sort of, you know, add to our understanding of our species? The second thing is the question of did our ancestors mate with Neanderthals? But it's even beyond this. The question is how much did they mate with Neanderthals? Did they mate with any other sort of ancient hominins? And then finally, the what I want to touch on is this question of how of is how healthy were our ancestors? How healthy were ancient humans? Also, how healthy were Neanderthals? And it's a little bit tricky, right? Because you don't always have remains that are in good condition. But um, hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll have an idea how genetic information might be able to give us a little bit of clue about our ancestors in that regard. So, you know, so some of you might have taken genetics classes way, way, way back when you were an undergrad. Um, but to give us sort of make sure we're all on the same page, I want to introduce our genome. So in in case you weren't aware, we have 22 pairs of autosomes, and those are things, those are chromosomes that we inherit from both parents. So you get one from your mom, one from your dad. We also have one pair of sex chromosomes. So you could have XX or XY. And Y chromosomes are basically they're paternally inherited. So if somebody is a Y, they tend to be male, they end up being male. And then we also all of us have mitochondrial DNA, but the mitochondrial mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited. And the important part here is that different parts of our genomes have different inheritance patterns. So if you just want to follow a maternal lineage, you can trace that back with this mitochondrial DNA. Another thing that you want to think about here is this idea that our DNA basically includes a lot of information about our history. So you can think about the metaphor of like a, a huge text and each one of these letters could be an A, a C, a T, or a G. But the size of this text is immense. So we're talking about 3.2 billion base pairs. So you can imagine just how many books that would involve. But the thing is, each generation, we tend to get 75 new mutations, okay? It can vary, it can be a little bit more, a little bit less. You think about half of those are roughly half are coming from your mom, roughly half coming from your dad. And so the idea is it's a text that's always changing, okay? And because it's changing, that actually lets us have sort of this, this look into our history. So you can think about well, what can it, what can affect our genomes? What can affect this, this sort of DNA record of our history? Some of it involves mutation, but there's also things like demographic history and natural selection. So if you look in genes or near to genes, you're going to see sometimes some evidence of natural selection. But sometimes you can look in this, these, these regions of our genome that are really far from genes, and those parts of your genome can tell you something about whether population sizes were big or small or all sorts of things in terms of history. It's sort of a sort of a GRE or a weird Scrabble word. You think about what, what does palimpsest mean? But one way to think about this is that our human genome, it's written over and over and over again. So you can think about it in terms of a text where you're not quite erasing, but it's, it's this idea that there's this information, history's changing it, but we, we, you can imagine that if something happened in the deep past, well, it's already been written over. So we, we, in terms of yeah, anthropological genetics, if we're trying to understand our history, we're much better at doing that if it's from the recent past. And then finally, the idea is that different parts of our genomes can tell different stories. So you can think even Y chromosomes versus mitochondria, those autosomes, these different chromosomes each have a little bit different history and they each give us a little bit different picture of what's going on. So one thing you might be wondering is like, well, OK, you're going to be talking about genetics and evolutionary history, but how is that relevant to health and disease? And one way to think about that is, you know, if you go to your family doc, you know, he or she's going to ask you, OK, well, tell me about your family history. And the idea is that that gives information for that physician to use a little bit more information and have a better idea about, OK, maybe I need to be a little bit more aware of these sorts of diseases. 
And on a big, big scale, the same sort of thing applies. So if you're thinking in terms of public health genomics, well, the idea is that if you knew a little bit about that population's history, that might even be informative. So you can think even something like sickle cell anemia, knowing if somebody was of recent African descent, well, that trait, you know, it's, it's, it's an evolved response to malaria. So like knowing that can actually benefit in terms of, in terms of that understanding. So what do we know about history? Well, the first thing that genetics really reveals is that Africa is the ancestral homeland of our species. OK, so the top panel here is showing, um, uh, I think it's like 300 different genomes from all over the world. And what we did in the study was we looked at genetic diversity all across the globe. And one thing you see, and this is something we've known for decades, actually, but with whole germ sequences, we can do some really, really cool studies of this. And what we found, and as did other groups, is that as you get farther and farther away from Africa, you see less and less genetic diversity. And so we're, if you look here, all the purple dots are African populations. You can see this is big drop in diversity as humans left Africa to explore the rest of the world. And when did this occur? Well, it's, it, the estimates vary, but you can say roughly on the order of 75,000 years ago. Some populations got out of Africa early, but a lot of them actually ended up not surviving that long. And so what ends up happening is as humans left Africa to explore other parts of the world, you end up having this subsetting of this original genetic variation. And so we end up calling that a population bottleneck, or sometimes you can think about it in terms of a founder effect. And what it does is it basically means that you've got this initial set of genetic diversity, but every time a subset of humanity moves to a new place, they're only bringing with themselves only a small or moderate amount of that original genetic diversity. Give a few hundred thousand years, and yeah, the diversity would go back up with new mutation. But what we see is the farther and farther you get away from Africa, the less and less genetic diversity we see. Another thing that happened if, in terms of our history is that it's not always a case of equal men and women moving different places. And one neat thing we can do is we can look at different parts of the genome and use that information to tell some things about male history and female history. So this is a study where we ended up looking at Y chromosomal DNA. So that's from men. You think about paternally inherited, passed on from fathers to sons and then to their sons and so on. Mitochondrial DNA, which is passed on from mothers to their kids and then is passed on only through the female lineage. And we can then use some phylogenetic tools and we can use this information to estimate the effective number of men and women at any point in the past. And if you might be wondering, like, what does it mean, the effective number of men and women? What it really means is how many people are contributing to gene pools. So in general, what we see is that with our mitochondrial DNA, we actually see that a lot more women were contributing to gene pools than men in general. And it sort of relates to this sort of this Genghis Khan effect. You can think about, well, some men are basically going childless and some are having a huge number of children. And so that's one thing that comes out. But what was really neat about this result is that we see a very different pattern when we look across time. And wherever you look in the world, what we see is, you know, roughly 8,000, 7,000 years ago, there's this massive drop in the number of men that are contributing to the human gene pool. And what that seems to indicate is when you have this mixing of hunter-gatherer and, and farming cultures, what ends up happening is that, well, women from both hunter-gatherers and farming cultures, they're contributing to the gene pool, but it seems like there's this real, real reduction. And it seems to hint actually that during the discovery of agriculture, you end up having, in some sense, it probably is the case where ancient hunter-gatherers weren't contributing that much if they happened to be male. So we see these sex differences in terms of, you know, contributions to who we are. We can also look across different populations. We can ask the question of, well, can we use genetic data to see who's more similar to, you know, which individuals happen to be closer? And so what this was a study where um, John November and his colleagues looked at roughly, think roughly 3,000 human genomes from Europe. And they had a requirement where all four of your parents had to be from the same country. And each one of these points is a single individual. And this is like a basically a genetic space. And so if two people have to have, happen to have really, really similar DNA, they're going to be next to each other in this space. So if you had an identical twin, well, that identical twin would be right on the exact same position. And they're color coded by the country that these individuals appeared in. And what's amazing about this is that actually you get this really, basically recapitulates this map of Europe. And so people that are from Ireland tend to have genomes that are very similar to people from Great Britain and so on. And you can basically look through this and it, it's this general, this idea that, well, you're more likely to share genetic material with people that happen to have grown up and lived in close, you know, closely to where you did. Historically, this is the case. Now it's very different, right? You think about planes, trains, automobiles, plenty of ways to get around the world, okay? But historically, this was the thing. 
It also is a case that's not just geography that matters, it's also language. So you can imagine that if you don't speak the same language as somebody, you're much less likely to mate with them. And so if you zoom in in the center of Europe here, you actually find some interesting patterns. So you see that people that are Swiss that speak French, um, or Swiss that speak German, or Swiss that speak Italian, they tend to cluster together. So there's also a big language component here. And once again, it's, it's, it's something to keep in mind is that language and geography are not independent. I mean, they're sort of interwoven together. But the idea is that this is just by looking at present day individuals, we can sort of place individuals. So if you didn't know some where somebody's you know grandparents were from and you were able to sequence their genome, and they happen to have European ancestry, you might be able to figure out where they live to within maybe 500 kilometers. It's not going to be the exact science, but at least there's some information there. And this is sort of what like Ancestry DNA and 23andMe, they use approaches that are a little bit different than this, but it's the same basic idea. What's really cool is you can use the same idea of genetic space, but you can look at not only modern humans, but you can look at ancient humans. So this is a study that came out five years ago, and it's a little bit to, to take in, but basically all you need to worry about this figure is whether it's a gray circle or a colored shape, okay? And the gray circles are present day Europeans. And then in all the colored shapes, those happen to be ancient humans in Europe. And so what the question they were trying to figure out is if you had say Scandinavian hunter-gatherers, which current populations look the most like them and so on. And one thing that was really interesting about this is when you do this matching up, most of the ancient Europeans don't actually look genetically that much like current day, present day Europeans. So you see these, you know, ancient European hunter gatherers, whether it's Scandinavia, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, they're not that similar. And what the, the ancient populations that actually tend to look a lot like modern day Europeans, at least in terms of their genetics, are ancient farmers. And so this goes along with this idea that as, as farming expanded out of the Middle East into Europe, basically what ended up happening is the farmers displaced and basically took over Europe. And so the hunter-gatherer sort of genomes and populations sort of withered away or basically interbred with these huge numbers of farmers that were there. There's some exceptions there. And it's actually, if you were to look at, you know, go back 5,000 years and you say like, okay, sample some individuals and say, well, which present day European populations do they look like? It actually turns out that they might look a little bit like people that are living in the island of Sardinia in the Mediterranean, um, which actually hints that there's sort of like secondary movements of people hasn't affected those islands as much as others. But the idea here is that, that whenever you look at any one place on the globe, it's not this case of this like unbroken chain of ancestry. A lot of times there's this movement of people from place to place. So not only can we use genetics to look at demography and to look at history in that aspect, we can also use genetic information to infer patterns of natural selection. So this is a review paper from Xiao Wafan from I think four years ago. And what they looked at is they looked at what are some examples of natural selection that we've seen in, you know, most of these are taking place in the last 10 to 50,000 years. And there's all sorts of traits. But well, one thing that sort of sort of cuts through all these different traits is a lot of recent natural selection in humans has to involve adaptation to diet, adaptation to, you know, sometimes to, to pathogen pressure, all sorts of things. And I think, you know, when you think about it, it's like, yeah, you know, immune function is really important to whether you survive or not. That makes a lot of sense. And so what I want to do is I want to zoom in on a really, really interesting example of this. And that involves adaptation to high altitude. So you might think of like, yeah, what is it like to live at high altitudes? You know, so it's like if you're in great shape, yeah, you might be able to do okay. But if you if you're in the Himalayas or in Tibet or in the Amhara Highlands of Ethiopia, if you're not adapted to that, whether that's the plastic response, whether it's in your genome, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to be out of breath. And there's ends up being a really really strong selective pressure in terms of hypoxia. And so. The idea is that, you know, you can imagine if a woman's giving birth and she has reduced, you know, concentration of oxygen, well, that's probably not going to be good for either her or the baby. And so if you could have some sort of genetic adaptation that gives you an advantage in that situation, then you're more likely to pass on your genes to the next generation. And so what ended up happening was 10 years ago, there was a study that compared Tibetans that were living in high altitude with Han Chinese that were living, I think they were in Beijing, but they're living in lowland areas. And what they did was they just looked all throughout the genomes of Tibetans and Han Chinese, and they were looking for genetic variants or alleles that were really, really different in frequency between the two. So if you're on the diagonal on that plot on the right, that means the allele frequencies are the same in both places. There's no differentiation. And if you're in the bottom left, that just means that they're both very, very rare. Both the interesting parts of the genome are the ones that are really far away from the diagonal. And what jumped out were genetic variants that were in this gene called EPAS1. 
And it actually turns out that this epas one gene is actually known to be turned on in, in whenever there's hypoxia. So it seems that these Tibetans actually happen to have some sort of adaptation to high altitude. And this has evolved sometime in, say, the last 30, 40, 50,000 years. Um, but the real surprise came a few years later when people looked at the Tibetan copies of this epas one gene, this, one, this gene that gives them an advantage in these low oxygen concentration regimes. It actually turns out that that came from what's known as the Denisovans, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about the Denisovans in a few minutes. But it basically came from the evolutionary cousins of Neanderthals. And it was just this big, big shock of like, wow, so it's adaptive and it comes from this other really, really strange hominid. So if we want to get at this idea about what are these other, other sort of evolutionary cousins of ours, the real, real way to get at this is to look at ancient DNA. And so when you can think about it is whenever you're looking at fossils, well, there's going to be a little bit of DNA, okay? And the idea is that you can, you, you can leverage that information to, to look at questions about ancestry, all sorts of interesting questions about history. If you go back a few million years, like if you think about the movie Jurassic Park, I mean, I don't think that's going to happen, but you can think about it where this issue of if somebody, say a Neanderthal, lived 55,000 years ago, okay, the DNA is going to be degraded, but you might be able to leverage some of that information. Another neat thing about ancient DNA is that it lets you, if, if done properly, what you could do is you could use this ancient DNA to get an idea about the health of that person that lived in the past. And you could do that even if there's very, very little remains. Maybe there's only a tooth. Maybe there's only a little bit of a pinky bone. Well, if you look at the DNA, you could still find some information. But there's some problems when you work with ancient DNA. And the first of all, it's contamination. So the first Neanderthal genome, I think when they sequenced it, it was like 98 or 90, so I forget the exact percent, but it was like 98% bacteria. Okay, so it was very, very little was actually Neanderthal DNA. There's also human contamination, right? You can think about what's the provenance of this bone, you know, and how many people are handling it. Um, apparently, if you think about, you know, people are trying to figure out, okay, is this a bone or is it rock? It's like, oh, they might lick the sample. It's like, well, yeah, whether that's, you know, sanitary or not, it's another question, but the idea is that now you're contaminating, contaminating it. So contamination is a huge issue. The other thing is because fossil DNA is so old and it's basically been broken over time, you've got really, really low quality DNA. Okay, so what that means is that often you're only going to be look at and able to look at little tiny parts of the genome. And one thing that actually can be leveraged there is the fact that fossil DNA tends to be low quality. It actually lets you separate between recent contamination from humans and what was low quality degraded DNA from this ancient sample. So actually sometimes what you end up doing is you can basically reach for low quality DNA because you basically know that that probably came from the ancient sample. And the byproduct of this is that whenever you're looking at any ancient individual, there's going to be a lot of missing data. You're not going to have information at all these 3.2 billion spots in the human genome. And one thing is that my lab, where we tend to be what we call a dry lab, we look at computers, uh, we, we analyze a lot of data. We're not there actually in the field directly ourselves. You know, we, we work with collaborators, we work with also with public data sets to do this. Um, but there are a number of labs that actually really do do the the, the yeoman's work of dealing with the ancient samples themselves, but it's very, very specialized. So one thing is when we've got these ancient samples, there, there ends up being a question of, well, did, how much did humans make with our evolutionary cousins? And there's a technical term here, and it's a little jargony, but I wanted to at least mention the, the proper term here. And it's what we call ancient introgression. And you're probably thinking of like, well, what does introgression mean? Well, all we're really talking about is hybridization that occurred in the deep past. So just mating between very divergent, you know, populations or individuals, but it needs to be, in this case, in the deep past. And if you, if you think about like the metaphor of a gene pool, what it really is, is just, gene, you know, alleles moving from one population to the next, okay? And the question then is, well, how can we look at ancient DNA and figure out has it occurred or not? And there's this wonderfully named test called the Abba Baba test. And what you do is you end up comparing four different genome, genomes and you, you run this test, okay? And what you're really doing is you're trying to see are there human populations that share genetic variants with Neanderthals? Because if they're shared, that hints that maybe there was mating between their ancestors. And so one way to do it is you have two different human genomes. You have a human from Africa, you have a human from non-Africa, or you could put, pick, say, a European and a Chinese individual. It doesn't matter where, but two humans from different locations. You also need Neanderthal DNA, and you need chimpanzee DNA as an outgroup. And what you're doing is you're just counting up how many times the human shares an allele with Neanderthal compared to that other human population. 
So in this case, on the left, we have non-Africans and we say, well, how much are they sharing with Neanderthal? Just count up how many sites. And then we look at an African genome and we say, well, how much does that individual share with Neanderthal? And the idea is that every time we've got an ABBA, an ABBA count, so this is the non-African sharing with Neanderthal, it's a little bit more evidence to show that there was gene flow from this Neanderthal lineage to the human lineage. If it's a BABA configuration, it means that there's the African genome shares the lower with Neanderthal. And when you do this sort of analysis, it doesn't matter which individuals you pick. Whenever you look at African versus non-African, you see way, way, way more of the ABBA, A-B-B-A example, than you see of the BABA. And that suggests that, well, non-Africans have more Neanderthal DNA than Africans, which sort of goes along with this idea that, yeah, maybe there was some sort of mating. You could actually do a sort of a matching algorithm too, and you can see like, oh wow, these non-Africans, they happen to actually just match the Neanderthal DNA exactly. So what do we know about ancient integration? Well, it turns out that whenever we look at humans, we find that most non-Africans have somewhere between one and 2% of their genome acts as Neanderthal. If you go to Northeast Africa, you see trace amounts. If you look at somebody whose genome is African-American, you might see zero, you might see something below a percent. Um, but generally what you see is this one to two percent range, okay? What was really surprising is that when we looked at different parts of the world, we actually found that people from East Asia had a little bit more Neanderthal DNA than Europeans, which is really shocking when you think about like, where did Neanderthals live? But what that seems to indicate is as humans left Africa and made it with Neanderthals, that happened, you know, you can think about, you know, it, it happened in basically probably in like, you know, Western Asia, Eastern Europe. And as that's occurring, you can imagine there's multiple times that humans are mating with Neanderthals and some of the, a little baby, a little bit more of those went, went to the East. Finally, what was, what was also surprising is that when people were looking at, originally looking at ancient DNA of Neanderthals, they thought all the samples you find would be Neanderthals. But it turned out that some of these were very, very distant from Neanderthals, okay? And so much so that you, you know, you call them, okay, are there a different species or different lineage? And this, this population of individuals ended up, be calling, ended up being called the Denisovans. And it's all because they were found in a cave and the cave was named after a hermit that lived there called Dennis. Okay, so it's a cave in Siberia and there's named the samples over, you know, where they found them. What's weird about this is that the one population that has the most Papua New, the most Denisovan DNA actually is Papua New Guinea. And you think Papua New Guinea and Siberia are very far, far apart, but the idea is that, you know, over thousands and thousands of years, humans are moving different places. And so if you look in like Southeast Asia, Papua New Guinea and, and, and Australia, you see traces of this, this Denisovan DNA as well. So who are the Neanderthals? Well, they're, they're not relatives, but they're definitely, you know, not that related to humans. So you think about humans and chimpanzees splitting maybe six million years ago. Well, Neanderthals and humans, our lineage just split roughly 650,000 years ago. There's estimates that range from 500 to 700,000, and there's, you know, big confidence intervals there. This physical, this, this plot here is showing the range of them, and this is based on archaeological data. So you can see largely found in Europe, but you see some sort of samples are found in, in Asia. And what's interesting is about if you go 40,000 years ago, you don't see physical Neanderthal samples left. And so the question is, did they just go extinct? Did they die off? You know, did, did ancient humans kill off Neanderthals? Well, it's possible. Another thing is maybe they just got assimilated. Maybe they basically, I don't want to say got bred out of existence, but maybe they just, because there weren't that many Neanderthals, maybe they sort of just became part of who we are as a species. And there's an interesting way of thinking about it is because if, if, if billions of humans have one to 2% Neanderthal DNA now, you can multiply that by how many people there are. There actually is more Neanderthal DNA now in present day humans than there was in Neanderthals 50,000 years ago. So it's sort of like, yeah, but it's only one or 2% in many of us. But it's just interesting to think that, that their genetic legacy, it lives on, it just might not be uh, completely. Um, and so this is a, the, the picture there is actually a French rugby player and he might have had maybe, maybe slightly more than 2% Neanderthal, it's hard to know. Uh, but you can see that some of these facial features, some of these characteristics, you know, you can imagine that they, they managed to persist to present day. And so if you think about it, so we're getting these one, 2% amount of Neanderthal DNA. Some of that involves good genes and some of it involves bad genes. So we're enriched for, for genes that are involved in skin and pigmentation, and actually some genes like that are, that are involved in innate immunity, we got from Neanderthals. And so in some sense, we got like the best parts of their genome. So some, some parts of our genome, we definitely benefited from that admixture. But, the other thing is that, that Neanderthal DNA wasn't that healthy in general. 
And the one way to think about it is that there weren't that many Neanderthals if you go back in time. And also what few Neanderthals there were actually were very, very inbred, okay? They did not have that much genetic diversity. And so what that meant is that a lot of Neanderthal genomes just weren't that healthy. They had more disease-associated alleles. So what ends up happening is this idea that, okay, even if we see one to 2% Neanderthal DNA in humans now, if you were to go back maybe 50,000 years ago when there was this mating occurring, it might have been anywhere from five to 10% Neanderthal DNA. But the Neanderthal DNA has basically been weeded out by natural selection. So what we've got are basically the copies of genes that were not that bad for us or sometimes beneficial. So it's this selective process is also going on. One thing that was, so, so we know about Denisovans, we know about Neanderthals, but there's some other neat ways that you can look at this idea about, well, did our ancestors mate with any weird different populations? And so some methods actually are fossil free. So you don't even need to have a fossil of a Neanderthal. And the way that these work is you just look at human genomes and you look for DNA that looks really, really different from normal human DNA. And what that means is that that stretch of DNA has a really, really long time before you have a common ancestor. And when we do this, wherever we look in the world, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in Europe, whether it's Asia, New World, any place, we see stretches of this DNA that looks like it comes from some sort of archaic population. But then when we look to see, like, well, was that Neanderthal? Was it Denisovan? It turns out that, no, it's neither one of them. So there's some evidence that, that our ancestors, you know, made it at least sometimes with what were known as ghost populations. There's nothing spooky about this. Um, it's just this idea that there are some populations that you just happen to not sample. Okay, you're missing just because we don't have a good fossil record of them. But yet there's this genetic legacy that lives on. And so it's not just a case of Neanderthals and Denisovans, but there's also these other lineage that we have no idea what they, what they actually look like. So the, the sort of like comprehensive picture of human history is something where it's not a simple picture, right? So there's all this mating that's going on. I don't know what it says about our species, but the thing about this is that when you look across these lineages, it's not just a case of populations or lineages splitting. There's also this coming back together. So these arrows indicate, you know, times where there was this introgression, this interbreeding of populations. Sometimes it's humans mating with Neanderthals and basically DNA going one way. Sometimes it goes the other way, but it's basically this really, really complex web. And you might be wondering, like, okay, we've got this, but but what does it really mean for my health? And, you know, I've got 2% Neanderthal DNA, she's got 1%. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't actually mean anything. And there was a really cool study a few years ago out of um, Vanderbilt. And so Kareen Simanti and Tony Copper and others looked at medical records in, in Vanderbilt's healthcare system. And what they did was they looked for insurance billing codes. And then they also looked at, for each one of these individuals, they looked at for every individual they had genetic data for, they looked to see, well, are there any billing codes or insurance records, any codes that actually are associated more with Neanderthal DNA and any ones with less, okay? And what they found was that people that had a little bit more Neanderthal DNA were more likely to be in the hospital for, for neurological or psychiatric disorders, okay? They actually were less likely to be in the hospital for anything that was digestive or cardiovascular. So this sort of was hinting that, okay, okay, maybe a little bit of like, you know, the chances of somebody getting depression, it might have something to do with how much Neanderthal DNA they had in their genome. It's, it's, it's a cool result, but it's something that to at least be a little bit cautious, a little bit skeptical, because it turns out that, you know, how much Neanderthal you have in your genome doesn't tell you that much about whether you're going to have a neurological disorder. It's explaining like a very, very small percent of the variance. But yet there still are these medical associations that are found with how much Neanderthal DNA you get. So that sort of sets the stage for some, some work that was done in my lab. And it, and it really actually came from a discussion that I was having with um, an undergrad, and the person that was an undergrad in the lab at the time, Taylor Cooper. And we were just talking about this question of like, well, we know that Neanderthals had really unhealthy genomes. I mean, ancient humans, well, we don't know how healthy they were, but what would, what would that first generation hybrid be like, right? So half Neanderthal, half human, how healthy would he or she be? And we're just like, well, we don't have a time machine, right? And we could make a mathematical model, we could try to figure out what that was, but that's easier said than done. And so we realized like, yeah, they're actually, at the time we're like, well, we don't have any examples of that F1, that first generation of that, but we do know that there's Neanderthal genes out there. We know there's ancient human genomes out there. And so the thought was that, you know what? We could look at this Neanderthal genome, we could look at ancient human genomes, and we could apply genomic medicine approaches to these ancient samples. And what we could do is basically say is, if that Neanderthal or ancient human was living today, 
how healthy might they have been? And it's sort of, you know, it's once again, we don't know in that ancient environment, but we can basically say, given their genetic information, we can try to infer something about health. And so that's what we ended up doing. But to first do that, we had to deal with this question of like, well, well what do we know about genetic disease risks? And so to do that, we leveraged data from what are known as genome-wide association studies. So if you ever see that in the news, it's sometimes you see GWAS, and the way that we say, we call that, we actually call that GWAS, okay? And what these basically, what these tests are doing is you're, bas you're looking for genetic variants that are overrepresented in people with the disease compared to people without the disease. So I've got a little toy example here where it's a two by two table, and we've got a total of, you know, so forget we're diploid. So basically we're talking about 5,000 individuals times two because we're diploid. So we've got 5,000 patients with coronary artery disease. We've got the same number of healthy controls, healthy in individuals. And what, all we're doing is we're just counting up how many times at one specific spot in the genome do the patients with coronary artery disease have an A allele versus a C allele. We do the same thing for the healthy controls. And when we do this, we're looking for things like this two by two table here. We're looking for you know, parts of the genome where you see a big difference in the proportions. So when it comes to patients with this heart disease, we see that, oh, wow, there's 30 percent of those happen to have this big A allele. And for the healthy individuals, it's only 25 percent. And when you do that, you can do a chi-square test. You can use, I mean, this is a big set, but you could maybe do a Fisher's exact test. But you do a statistical test to figure out, is this a significant difference between the groups? And then you do this, repeat this test in a million different sites throughout the human genome. And you identify those parts of our genome that show the most association with the disease. And then there's been over 4,000 of these studies have been done. And to date, this is catalog of all these results. And there's 197,000 of these genetic associations. OK, some of these are secondary hits. Some of these you don't really trust. And some of these actually don't have to do with disease. But there's a great resource out there. And so you can think about, well, we've got all this genetic information. How do we leverage it? And so when we've got all this information, we can use this in something that's called a polygenic risk score. You think about it as a genetic, or it's a genetic risk score. And all we're doing with a polygenic risk score is we're just counting up how many bad alleles for that disease do you have compared to me, compared to her, compared to him, and so on. And, and one way to think about it is maybe I've got 64 risk alleles and maybe you've got 69 or 70 or 71. What that means is you might have a little bit more risk for that disease. And so this equation is showing a very simple way of doing this and you're just counting up how many copies of this you have. Okay, you think about sort of it's almost like an environmental exposure, but instead of it being environment, we're looking at sort of a genetic exposure. We're weighting it by the effect size of these different genetic variants. And it's actually sometimes can work okay. And so what this is, is from a recent paper from Kara et al. And what they were doing is they looked at a huge number of spots in the human genome and they counted up how many risk alleles somebody had, how many of these genetic risk factors. And then they divided their samples into different percentiles. So they could say, are you in the 99th percentile for this risk score for coronary artery disease? Or are you in the 10th percentile, 20, 30, 40? Each one of those dots corresponds to a different percentile. And then what they did is they then they looked into health records from these individuals. And when they did this, you can see that there's this clear relationship between what's your percentile of risk and what's your prevalence for coronary artery disease. So you really don't want to be in the top one, two, or three percent. You don't want to be in the 99th percentile for this. You can see that the, the, the risk of getting coronary artery disease is much, much higher, okay? But you can see it also is somewhat informative on the lower end. So some individuals, you know, just happen to be really lucky. They happen to have a genetic risk for coronary artery disease. That's not that bad. And so the idea with this is that these polygenic risk scores can be used to triage individuals in terms of risk. OK, sometimes you might already know that from family history. But the idea is that if you had your DNA analyzed and you realize that you were in the extreme high end of this polygenic risk score, maybe it means that you might want to check in with a cardiologist more than somebody else would. OK, and so it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the disease. So even in the highest bin here, we see that, you know, it's only a 10 or 11 percent chance of getting coronary artery disease. But it still is way higher than people that are at less risk. And so what we did is we applied these same principles to ancient samples. And we're lucky enough that we're living in what is basically the golden age of ancient human genomics. And in Unfortunately, though, a lot of what we know is based in Europe. And some of it has to do with the fact that it's really hard to get good quality fossil DNA in other parts of the world. But when we did this study, most of the samples that were available that were of good 
coverage, a good, where we basically had good quality DNA, um, not in terms of health risk, but just in terms of you know, how degraded it was in terms of the sample. Most of those came from Eurasia. So we analyzed a total of 147 of these, these genomes. And then we curated a set of disease associations. So we looked at three, fat, we had 3,180 different genetic associations with disease. So it's a genetic variant that say it's associated with breast cancer. Or maybe another one's associated with, um, you know, some sort of a muscle disorder. Okay, we, and for each one of those disease associations, we classified in terms of which disease it affects. And we ended up applying this, this idea of a polygenic risk score to all these ancient samples. And so this sort of, these sort of, these pokey plots sort of explain what's going on here. And so just for the sake of this argument, let's just say that there's only four genetic risk factors that affect a particular disease. So we're looking at an ancient genome. And in this case, they happen to be heterozygous for the first site. Okay, so red ends up being the bad allele, blue is the good one here. They're homozygous for the, the risk factor in the second one. We're missing data, okay, it's incomplete data. For the third, and then they're homozygous for the fourth. The little numbers in the middle correspond to the effect size. So that fourth genetic variant has a big effect on whether you get the disease. The first one doesn't have that much, and the second has a moderate amount. And what we did, though, is the problem we realized is that whenever we're looking at ancient samples, we're sort of comparing apples to oranges, because the idea is that each ancient sample is missing a different fraction of its genome. And so how do we make a fair comparison between different samples? And so what we ended up doing is we compared each ancient genome to modern day people, and then we masked out all the missing data. And so instead of just a raw count or a raw risk score, what we did is we said, well, what percentile would you be? And so for the data that we had for this individual, he or she happens to have more of these red alleles than most of the modern genomes we're looking at. We're looking at thousands and thousands of modern genomes, but it allows us to assign a percentile. So we end up getting a percentile risk score for each of these disease classes for each of the ancient samples. And so what does that look like? Well, it looks like this, and this is a, what we call a risk radar. Um, I think of other ways to visualize it, but what it's doing is it's showing what's the percentile rank for each one of these disease categories. And so if you want to be healthy, you want to have a very, very small gray shape. Um, this is uh, showing Otzi the Tyrolean Iceman, um, a rather famous ancient sample, um, so famous that apparently Brad Pitt has a tattoo of Otzi, I don't know why. But the idea here is when we look at Otzi's genome, we actually see that he has a really, really high cardiovascular disease risk, a really, really high immune disease risk, but for morphological and neurological diseases, he's actually in pretty good shape. It turns out that his arteries were very, very bad. And so it actually matches um, our genetic, quote, prediction for this. But it turns out that that wasn't what killed him. I mean, he ended up dying because another human killed him. But the idea with this is that you can use genetic data to basically figure out like, well, where on the curb would this individual be if he or she was living today? And sometimes it works well, like at OTC, but other times there might not be a perfect match. And so when we actually look at Neanderthal samples, sometimes it matches what we know from the Green Samante study earlier of clinical data, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that a lot of these ancient samples, we don't have, you know, you know, morphology to compare it to. So one neat thing about this is in our data set of 147 ancient samples, we've got all different types of subsistence patterns. And so what Ali and Teva did is they analyzed all the hunter, hunters and gatherers from Europe, but you're from Eurasia that they found, all the ancient farmers, and all the ancient pastoralists. These are herding populations that are found on the steppes of Eurasia. And when they do this, we actually find that the pastoralists seem to have healthier genomes, that that green shape is smaller than the red and the, and the yellow. We can also zoom in on individual traits. And so we look at immune function, it actually looks like ancient hunter-gatherers seem to be a little bit worse off when it comes to their, their, the genetics of their immune system. And so it could be, there could be plenty of causes here, but one thing to think is that, well, you know what, ancient farmers and ancient pastoralists, they're already probably in bigger population de densities or they're living with cattle, and so maybe there might have been a little bit more natural selection on their immune system. We can also look at other traits like, like genetic factors that affect dental health. When we look at this, it actually turns out that the ancient farmers are way worse than the ancient hunter-gatherers and pastoralists. Actually turns out that ancient farmers had really bad teeth, but that probably was just because they had a very different diet. They also had a very different oral microbiome, the different, you think about the microbes in your mouth. Well, that's going to be shaped by many things. And so just because ancient farmers had bad teeth, it doesn't mean it had to come from their genetics in terms of this. But at least the genetic data is consistent with what's observed there.
We can also look at these ancient samples over time. So what Allie and Taylor did is they divided these samples into roughly similar bins. Each one of these bins is roughly 1,500 years. So on the bottom, we've got deep red. Those are samples that are less than 3,500 years. They lived less than 3,500 years ago, all the way up to the really old samples that lived, you know, 10,000 years and deeper in the past. Um, the, what we then did is we looked at, we pooled all these different disease types together, and we just wanted to see how healthy were individuals on the whole, okay? And whenever we looked at a different time interval, we saw individual ancient individuals. Some of them had really healthy genomes. Some of them had really unhealthy genomes. So there's a still, we're still getting this range that we see in modern humans. But there's a general trend that happens is that you get, if you look down this plot, going from the purple to blue to green to yellow to orange to red, we see the shift towards the left. And that with that shift to the left, that's a lower risk score percentile. What that means is that ancient individuals seem to be getting healthy over time. So they seem to have less counts of these risk increasing alleles as time progresses. And maybe that has to do with maybe natural selection leading it out. It could be all sorts of factors there. But if anything, it's sort of saying that our genomes seem to be getting better. But given this, it's, it's also important to have a caveat in that all we know right now are genetic variants that are associated with disease that we can see in present day humans. There's plenty that maybe were there in the past, but we're just not able to know them, right? Because we don't have that time machine. And so the idea here is that there's a chance that, that, there, that some of this stuff you have to be a little bit skeptical, but there still is this, this general temporal or time trend there. And so lastly, I wanna end, instead of looking to the past, I wanna look a little bit to the future here. And it's, to me, it's one of the most interesting questions out there. And it's, you know, how are human genomes going to be different in the future? And then why, right? It's not just, you know, where are we headed, but it's like, well, what's gonna, what's gonna drive it there? And you think about 2020 has been quite a year, you know, and you think about, you know, are humans getting dumber? You know, are we living in the movie Idiocracy? Maybe. Um, and so maybe that's one place that we're headed, who knows? Could also be a little bit more benign. It could be something like what's seen in Wally, where we've got this really cushioned lifestyle, right? So, you know, we've got comfy beds, we've got shoes, we've got air conditioning in Georgia. All these things, basically, that's a relaxation of selection pressure. And basically, we're living in different environments. And you can imagine that if you were fast forward the tape of life, maybe you'd see humans that look a little bit different. And so there's at least three different ways that our genomes are changing. First thing relates to these sort of cartoons above, and that's this idea that selection pressures are changing. Things that used to be bad no longer are, right? So we can think about modern medicine as wonderful things. You, know, you can think about how many people need glasses. Well, maybe in the past that maybe would be disadvantageous, but now there's technolo technological solutions to things, okay? Also, we've gone through this transition where, you know, infant mortality and child mortality used to be horrendous. But now we have modern medicine, we have antibiotics, we have other treatments. And because those selection pressures are changing, you can imagine that that's going to shape our genomes a little bit too. We can also think of a second reason. We can think about, well, now there's this potential to do genetic engineering, you know, change your genome. And so this is vision of like the movie Gattaca. But in practice, there's a lot of issues here. And so a lot of them have to do with ethics. And I think, you know, that's a topic for another day. But the idea is that even if we had the technology, would we want to do it? So a couple of years ago, there was all the scandal of the, the CRISPR baby coming out of China and like, you know, somebody, you know, doing genetic engineering in terms of children and whatnot. That's only at a single spike spot on the genome, though. And so the idea is that even though, even if we as a society, society decide that, okay, that's something we're comfortable with, and that's not even a given, I don't think that's going to massively change our genomes that much. What I think actually will change it a lot more is what's well, this idea of populations mixing, okay? And you can, it sort of is this, this, where we're getting farther and farther away from what happened in, in, in deep history where you could only mate with somebody that was born, say, five, 10 miles or kilometers from where you happen to be born, because you weren't, you know, you didn't have much contact with other people. Now we get populations that are completely mixing. And so you can think about, you know, you know, we've got the census of this year, and you think about your checking, you know, what what do you what's your self-described ethnicity or race or whatever label you want to use. As we go forward, I think what'll happen, what seems to be this trend is that, you know, almost everybody will eventually click mixed. And so I think this thing of like, it's, it's all of these matter, but I think what we're really starting to see is this mixture of different populations and that that's really what's going to be driving it. But once again, we don't know yet. And, you know, something that we'll find out hopefully you know, in the future. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, the Atlanta Science Tavern. And, you know, once again, if, if this was, you know, any other year, this would be held at Manuel's Tavern.
Um, also want to thank Science for Georgia, Lewis and Brandy and all the other um, people there. And then also I'd like to thank um, funding sources. So um, funded by grants from the National Institutes of Health, also funded by Georgia Tech. And um, thank you very much for taking time out of your Saturday night to take a little look. So great. Yeah, so actually um, James is asking a question about some home genetic tests will tell you your percent Neanderthal ancestry, 23andMe. How accurate are those? So 23andMe actually is a really good team of scientists. Um, it's it's something where I would be relying, I mean, it's if it's like, if you had like 1.4% and somebody or one of your friends said 1.44, I wouldn't trust that like third digit, right? So, so it's, it's something where, yeah, I can separate somebody that's got a lot of, from a little, but if you saw a number like 4%, it's like, well, that would be too far off. And I think for Neanderthal, they do a pretty good job. What's actually really tough is if you're looking at different human populations and you would say that, oh, wow, you've got 1% that happens to come from Zimbabwe. And somebody else is like, oh, I've got zero. When you're down in that like low percent, I would be really, really skeptical of it. And so actually talking with people from Ancestry and 23andMe, they're like, yeah, if it's less than 5%, it's really hard to assign. And so, you know, and so some of it depends on the scale you're looking at. Um, there's actually, um, of all things, there's an article on Gizmodo where they actually, somebody submitted their, their DNA to every company they could. It was National Geographic, actually, 23andMe, Ancestry, um, and then also some of their data they sent to a company called Genco, and they got back similar results, but the proportions were all different. So like the, the mix of where their ancestors came from, well, you could tell it was these parts of the world, but sometimes it was like 20%, sometimes 40%. Um, and so, but, but when it comes to the Neanderthal DNA, I think it, it actually works pretty well in terms of that. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, so, yeah, so I think that's, yeah, so Brandy's question is about the male versus female contrib contribution. And I think one way to think about it is that um, it's way easier for one man to have, you know, eight or nine kids than it is for one woman to have eight or nine kids, unless you're like Octomom. So it's like, I think that's one way to think about it, is that there's a, the mean number of kids is going to be the same for men and women, but the variance is really, really different. And so there's some individuals that could have a huge number of sons or daughters, and the others are basically contributing zero. And so if you look at the differences in both sexes, you can see a big difference in the, the variance of the number of offspring, because the mean has to be the same there. So um, hopefully that makes makes some sense there. Um, and I think that's one way. There's actually some question of like, when, when, when our ancestors transitioned from a hunter-gatherer lifestyle to something that was more agricultural, did we get this, you know, how did it change our social structure? So there's actually some evidence that maybe hunter-gatherer populations were a little bit more egalitarian, and then it's a lot, a lot easier to have, like, somebody basically, you know, having a massive contribution to gene pool. One last thing with this is that, so, so I mentioned Genghis Khan, and basically his Y chromosome is an arguably the most successful Y chromosome among humans. There's also evidence in, uh, and I'm going to mispronounce it, but it's basically Nile of the Nine Hostages in Ireland, in the northwest part of Ireland. And there's this warlord that lived a few hundred years ago, and it looks like his Y chromosome is overrepresented there. But you don't see that same sort of thing if you look at mitochondrial DNA, and that's really because it's you know, you can imagine an extreme scenario where one guy happened to have 100 kids. You can't really imagine that for, for one woman. Um, so Lucine's got a question here about, yeah, immune disease. Yeah, so what did we mean by immune disease? So what we did is we basically linked, linked anything with immune function or autoimmune function, and we basically bend that in there. So it could be some stuff that maybe has something to do with inflammation. It, it's, it's a very, very catch-all sort of thing. And I think this was an initial study. Um, and so what we really want to do is look at the catalog has grown since. And what we want to do is we want to look a little bit more specific. So rather than saying all immune disease, you know, we want to narrow it down. Like even one of the other categories was cancer. And then it's like, well, there's not just one type of cancer, right? There's many, many different types. But for the sake of that, that study, we just lumped it together. So it's anything that could do with immune function. There are some things you could think about some disease that's like, well, it's immune function and it's also involved in digestive traits. And so for that, we allowed it to count for both. Um, let's see. So um, Yvonne Garcia, does COVID-19 is impact on certain areas of science? Yeah, so this is actually an interesting question of like how much are there, I mean, we know that there are differences in terms of how people, you know, in terms of, you know, there are health disparities in terms of COVID. The question is how much of that is due to genetics? 
And I would actually think that it would be surprising to me if there wasn't any genetic component and there wasn't anything to do with the genetics in that. But I think a lot of that actually has to do with access to care and, and, and also exposure in terms of things like that. Um, there, you know, there's some examples of like the, the, T, the toll like receptor genes that came from Neanderthals, these, these immune genes that came from Neanderthals. You can imagine that when it comes to COVID, you know, maybe you'd be better off or, or worse off depending on whether you've got genes from Neanderthals in that sense. Um, but I think I think one way to think is, is, is one now way to view it is that yes, genetics can contribute. But even as a geneticist, I think for COVID, it's probably these other factors that that play a more of a role. So let's see. Um, yeah, yeah. So actually, Alex's question is about what what was it like? You know, so when we have any sort of like decent decent quality remains, what can we say about ancient people? Yeah. So the paleo diet. I mean, I guess, it, you know, it's, it's, I mean, th there are good reasons to not eat massively processed foods, right? But the, I mean, I would say, yeah, the paleo diet does fit with the fad. It's, what's actually really interesting is what, when humans discovered agriculture, it actually looks like we got sicker. And it's sort of strange to think, wait, wait, we have, and actually malnourishment was a bigger issue. But also when humans got agriculture, you have this change in lifestyle and you, you go from having a very, very diverse diet to something that's much, much you know, simpler, and you could also think about that, well, malnourishment might occur. Also, you go from having a very low population density to living in cities and living in the sort of, you know, an environment where, you know, don't drink from that water, you know, where if you were moving around, it's actually a very, very different environment. So the idea that some ancient people might have been pretty fit and healthy, but not necessarily. I think one thing that's interesting there, too, is that, so, and I, this the study was like over 10 years old, so I'd had to revisit it. But they were comparing human and chimp genomes and trying to figure out like what differentiates us from chimpanzees. And it turns out that a lot of genes that are involved in metabolism of, say, more of an omnivorous or, or a little bit more of a meatier diet seem to have evolved a little bit more in our lineage. And so it's this, this idea that, you know, basically we we we're sort of optimized for the diets that our ancestors that lived 10,000 years ago ate, okay? Evolution hasn't quite caught up, um, but you can see this in terms of many different things. So if you look at like um, Inuit um, individuals living in Greenland, you can actually see that their genomes have some adaptations that look like they're, you know, they have mutations in fatty acid uh, desaturase genes that basically mean that if you have a very fish heavy diet, maybe you'd want to have enzymes that can deal with the fact that it's so fish heavy. Um, so hopefully it answers that a little bit. So Brandy also had a question about, yeah, the Tibetan and Peruvian to hypoxia. And then also think about highlands in Africa. It turns out that you get different genes that come up in each one of these studies. So a lot of them are involved in the same physiological trait. So it's convergence on a trait level. But in terms of genetics, it's very different answers. Um, and it's also, <laughs> it's also sort of interesting. You could have two different research groups. They study the exact same population. They often find different genes. And so the question is, are both of those studies right? Or, you know, was there a difference in the methodology? But the general sort of answer to Brandy's question about high altitude adaptation is that often it's different genes, but it's the same, same physiological traits in terms of that that you see. So, Martha's got a question uh, with agriculture, stratification, taxation, wars. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think I think she's right. I mean, I think it's it's something where you can imagine that if you have a society that's got a smaller number of people and there's less ability for somebody to accumulate resources. Well, that in its very nature is going to make it a little bit more egalitarian. Um, yeah. So, yeah, kudos could be confirmation bias. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the thing, Lewis's question is about, yeah, can you get a risk radar map for themselves? So 23andMe really wanted to go into this sort of avenue. The big issue is that they actually had a lot of court battles because the problem is, is that if you go to a doctor and you get a diagnosis or, you know, if you get a genetic test, you might get matched up with a genetic counselor. And that genetic counselor can, can interview you, can interact with you, and you can get some feedback about what your results mean. The worry is like, oh wait, if somebody just gets their DNA from, you know, from a company, would they act on it? And so what ended up happening was there were a lot of restrictions so that in terms of polygenic scores, companies are really, really, and I would say rightfully handcuffed. And so they're, they're very limited in what they can tell. They can tell you stuff when it's much more of a simple, clean Mendelian situation. Um, so what you could do if you really wanted to, if you got your DNA, if you let's say you had your, you were genotyped by 23andMe, you could 
there, there's, there are some companies that are trying to do some sort of like aftermarket things where basically you send it there, your genetic data, and they'll be able to spit back something to you for, quote, entertainment reasons. Um, but you're not going to be able to get that yet from 23andMe or, or Ancestry. 23andMe is going towards that, but I mean, once again, it's the legal issue. And one way you could think about the risk there is you think about a few years ago where um, Angelina Jolie was, di you know, had had a genetic test and knew that she had some mutations in the BRCA, I think it was BRCA1 gene, but it was it meant that she had a big genetic risk for, for, for breast cancer. So she had, basically before she had any breast cancer, she opted for mastectomies related to that. And it's like, yeah, I don't know if I'd go that far into saying, well, I've got a genetic predisposition for something, that means I'm going to do something that early. And I think that's one reason why there's this, this sort of caution in terms of that. Um, but yeah, I think it's once you've got that data, you know, you could, in principle, do it yourself. I mean, I think one thing to keep in mind is that it tells you what you where you are compared to other people in terms of what we know, but there's still a lot of genetics that we don't know. And, and it's also, you can think about, like, you don't know all the genetic factors associated with disease. You don't know all the environmental risk factors. What you still know is like where you are on the curve. And where I think this is actually most useful is actually for, for a disease like breast cancer. And even if you know you have family risk, there's actually evidence that this is a team that was based in the UK. And what they were able to show is based on the risk score, they could figure out when was the optimal year for somebody to go in for start going for mammograms. And you can imagine that if you were in the highest risk, if a woman's in the highest risk bin for breast cancer, maybe she should get a mammogram a little bit earlier than if somebody that was in a lower risk bin, right? Because there's always trade-offs in terms of medical testing, in terms of cost, or, or in terms of health. Um, so, yeah. So... Hopefully it makes sense. Um, yeah, what's well, James? That might have been this week. So actually, there was a paper that came out on Thursday. Yeah, and so it works both ways, right? So if you go back in time when there still were, you know, Neanderthals walking around, they actually some Neanderthals actually had a little bit more little human DNA in them. And so there's a paper actually that came out Thursday, I think. Yeah, so two days ago, which was looking at Y chromosomes, and it actually turns out that. Neanderthals seem to have gotten a Y chromosome that looks sort of human. I mean, a pretty human. And it actually looks like it's something where instead of going, you have having to go back 650,000 years, you only have to go back, I'd say only, but it's 380,000 years. Okay, so there's some evidence that, the, that, that you know, I, I would say like a proto-human Y chromosome made it into Neanderthals before either one of our lineages got out of Africa. So... And so there's some evidence that, yeah, there's genes going the other way. Um, and, that, and I'm trying to think if anybody's done a, a comprehensive study on that. But one way to think about it is that, you know, it's, it's the fact that you have this mix of different, you know, human Neanderthal. You can imagine it's not just, you know, are those alleles, are those, are those genetic variants associated with disease? But how well do they play with the other ancestry, right? So you can imagine that you have genetic variants that were in humans. They make their way into the Neanderthals or vice versa. And they've never seen the rest of the genome in this other, this other population. And so that could be potentially something that's beneficial or could actually be something that's not so beneficial. And so that's one, one thing to think is that maybe this human DNA that made into Neanderthals, it might have been good for Neanderthals. It might not might have been bad, but, but we don't know yet. So, uh, With that, I want to say uh, have a great weekend, everyone. Stay safe. And I'll see you at our next science event. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm.